This video will begin with a document which is allegedly from the year 1735, although it does cite many things that are from the previous century of the 1600s. The title of this document is Le Memoir Signifie, or The Significant Memory, although it could possibly be translated into a couple different ways considering the nature of this document. It is for les jours en charge et communat de maître brodeur. So that's for the jurors or yeah, I, I suppose you would probably translate this jurors today in charge and uh, committee of master embroiderers and Chasoublier de la Ville et Falsbourg de Paris Intime. So that's the city of Paris and Falksbourg. Now it is against or contre a uh, list of names. Um, you've got uh, Donny Portier, Louis Pinovouve Duport, Marie Magdalene Lebre Vouve de Manche. So that's two people with the last name Veuve. Nicole Chateloup, Femme Bissou. Uh, two ouvriers, so that's all overseers and overseers of quality. Now I don't know what the difference is there. This is very old French. And translation is a little bit difficult because you have to consider the time that it's been written and that they would might use these words in different contexts than we might especially considering the constant uh, shifting of language through quote authoritative means but it also stipulates it's against the workers of arts of embroidery in gold and in silver so that's embroidery of gold and silver which is interesting like gold and silver thread that type of thing if you know what embroidery is uh, in the Le Faustbourg Saint Antoine, it's a Saint. Uh, I, I'm not really. I don't remember what the translation for Antoine is, and uh, that's Faustbourg, of course. Called the uh, yeah. So anyway, it's against them, but it is also together against the religious women of the Abbey of Saint Antoine uh, intervening. And I believe that is intervening uh, women of the uh, religious women. <clears throat> but uh, Jean Baptiste, Baptiste, uh, the master embroiderer. So there's a many interesting things in this document, but we're going to go ahead and look at specific ones for the context of this video. And we won't necessarily have to read through this document nor highlight everything in it. The first thing that this document points out is the use of the word privilege and what it means. We are very much misled about this word often today, especially when it comes to things like a driver's license, where they state stuff like driving is a privilege and not a right, and all of these other different phrases that they state that a privilege is something that can be given and taken away, when in fact that is essentially the same use of the word right. Anyway, in this document, we get evidence and proof of not only precedent or the pre-cessation of, of the theme or of the argument that a privilege is an exception to the rule and a particular grace or um, a particular, well, privilege, <laughs> uh, to the sovereign in uh, agreement uh, well basically the main sentence there is that a privilege is an exception to the rule that's important for the rest of this video now in a different part of this document it highlights many things that we find reflected in legal documents of today especially when it comes to the so-called jurisprudence and um, 
opinions of the court, legal matters, uh, letters and stuff. One of those, of course, is letters patent from 1657, lettre patente. And again, these words could be used in a completely different way and context than we are used to because of the shifting of language and its meaning. Now, this also document also refers to the sovereign in many parts. And the overall scheme of this document presents legal, quote unquote, uh, jurisprudence sort of, not, not just opinions, right? It talks a lot about statutes, decisions by different groups and the sovereign, and then repeals of those decisions, and then reemplacement of those things, different statutes, decrees, and uh, different letters of officialdom or legality. And it has a lot of different mannerisms and overall pattern that we find reflected in documents of today, but the distinctions are very clear and interesting, such as with the title, where it states significant memory, rather than say something like a document charging of charges or something like that that we might find today, or uh, appeal to a court and so so on and so forth. It's just a document of memory of a significant memory. Also, this document apart from its clarification on the word on the word um, privilege it also reflects a lot of things in the language that can be found in say the Vatican code where it talks about the sovereign and the powers of the sovereign and all that other stuff and it's interesting because the sovereign as it's reflected here is applied to nearly everything across the globe in relation to the Vatican and the Roman pontiff Quote unquote. It is not the same way that people refer to governments. That is a very important distinction. A sovereign, in the way that they speak here, is an entity that holds, that doesn't hold privilege, but that decrees privilege. A sovereign is somebody who establishes privilege. And so that's very important for the context of this video. And of course, the other note is that jurar is the word for to promise. So a lot of us have definitely lost what the real, thi what the real context behind the word jury is and what jurors are, because very few people today, especially in the United States, because of our education systems, um, desire to proliferate ignorance, well, very few people understand that jurar means to promise something, to swear an oath in French. And that's where a jury comes from. So you could have, as here, a jury of, of master embroiderers, right? That's a jury because they've all sworn oaths and promises and whatnot, and then they sit in, in a committee jury or a committee of oath swearers as far as embroidery goes. This document also makes reference to judges, parliament, and ordinances. So these are where we get all of our words from that we use today in manners that we don't understand. And you have a lot of people that use words in ways they don't understand constantly in an effort to give themselves the appearance of officialdom or the official appearance of authority, not necessarily the actual authority, but the appearance of. Here it talks about the point of right, right? Primairement, le vœu de port n'ayant point droit de procéder directement au Parlement. So he had the, or he did not, have the point of right, or the right point, to proceed directly to Parliament. And of course, Parliament comes from the word parler, which is to speak, and you have the same similar nonsense with the propaganda around pirates about requesting parler. That is requesting to speak. 
they would not have requested parlay because that is a mixing of languages. They would have requested to speak or they would have uh, demandé le parler, something like that. I don't imagine they probably would use, wouldn't have used the word demandé and they probably would have flowered it, uh, made it a little bit more flowery in their requests and things like that. But he also, uh, this document mentions les juges naturels, so natural judges, and again, they might not be talking about, or this person might not be talking about judges in the same way that we might, because of the screwing around with the language. And it also talks about in terms of the ordinance of 1667 and the judges of Châtelet. Now, we also get some interesting wording here with the word loi, still the same word used for law, but uh, considering the the lack lack of spelling difference, but the sound that it makes is of of law in or law in French is pretty much the same pronunciation as law in English, but the spelling is incredibly different, and that might have been done on purpose for misdirection, or it could have been some sort of natural spelling thing where somebody heard it heard the sound and spelled it a different way based off of their native tongue. But you get this section where it talks about the condemning for sentences. Hence the idea of sentencing nowadays. Sentencing has basically taken the position of condemning. Somebody who is being condemned for sentences, right? You could be condemned for sentences or, or a clause in a particular document or ordinance or decree, right? You got a sentence there and that sentence is used to condemn. You could also be condemned for sentences that you yourself speak or write. And in that sense, the condemning for sentences became just sentencing. And nowadays, nobody understands what the word sentencing actually comes from when it comes to law, because the people that make themselves presiders over the law seek to violate it. And this comes into the context of another document about a court case in the Southern District of Ohio. And here we get a very interesting section from the judge where it states immunity. Several defendants are immune from liability. Judicial immunity. Taking the factual allegations in the complaint as true Plaintiff's claims against defendant Judge Saving are barred by judicial immunity. And here we get an example of this privilege, right? The privilege to the rule established by a sovereign. Obviously, if you're going through all the different videos I've done or all the different evidence, that sovereign would point to the Roman Pontiff of the Vatican and that the United States government is a subsidiary of the so-called universal church order or regime that is set up through the United Nations and all of these other mechanisms. So the sovereign gives privileges to specific people, making sure that they have a privilege against the rule. Everybody else has to abide by its rules, but they don't. That's where this idea of judicial immunity comes in. Anyway, judicial immunity shields judges and other public officials. Notice that st phrase right there, other public officials. That would have to do, or officers, other public officers. That wouldn't be like the natural public, like what we'd thinking, be thinking that's the juridic public or public corporations. From undue interference with their duties and from potentially disabling threats of liability. Like other forms of official immunity, judicial immunity is an immunity from suit, not just from ultimate assessment of damages. Judicial immunity is an overcome only if the actions taken were not in the judge's judicial capacity and if the actions taken were in absence of all jurisdiction. So, of course, in their little sandbox, they make all these rules and then they prescribe privileges to themselves, freeing them from those rules. So they are 
in essence, above their laws. Because nobody's enforcing the true law or the supreme law of the land, they can get away with it. Anyway, plaintiff alleges that defendant Judge Saving signed off on defendant Cluley's search warrant that was almost entirely perjured, failed to question the obviously deficient search warrant, and signed off on a search warrant for a case that he knew or should have known his wife would be prosecuting. But these allegations do not lend to an inference that defendant Judge Saving was acting outside of his judicial capacity when he issued the warrant. Holding that municipal judge was immune from plaintiff's allegations that she conspired to and violated his civil rights when she signed a search warrant authorizing the search of his residence. Well, there, therein lies your main problem. First of all, dealing with this corrupt nonsense. Secondly, that allegations of civil rights violations isn't going to get you anywhere with these people because that is their sandbox. It's what they set up. These are violations of the law. All of these things being done in this document, the so-called judicial immunity, they're violating the law. They are crimes. They're violations of the supreme law of the land. Anyway, the name is true regarding plaintiff's allegation, or the same is true regarding plaintiff's allegations that defendant Judge Saving knew or should have known that his wife was involved in the case. Again, there are no facts in the complaint from which court could infer that defendant Judge Saving acted in the absence of all jurisdiction. To the extent plaintiff may be alleging bias on the part of defendants that infected the fairness of their rulings and proceedings, plaintiff's allegations of bias or misconduct do not render the actions of defendants non-judicial. So basically, if it's in their sandbox, if they deem it being as being judicial, then they can do whatever they want. Pretty much. In sum, even construing the complaint in the light most favorable to plaintiff, his claims against defendant judge saving are barred by judicial immunity and must be dismissed. Prosecutorial immunity. Of course, naturally, the judges and the prosecutors would be the first on the list of being immune from their own crimes. Because that's what they always like to do, shift liability and immune themselves from, well, liability. Anyway, relatedly, plaintiff's claims against defendant Abigail Saving are barred by prosecutorial immunity. Prosecutors are absolutely immune from liability for their actions that are intimately associated with the judicial phase of the criminal process. Well, here's the problem. This is a different criminal process than the one that's legitimate. That's the reason. The criminal process that they're instituting is in itself a crime because it is in violation of the U.S. Constitution, the supreme law of the land. Therefore, that is a criminal offense as far as the Constitution goes, but as far as their sandbox goes, they recognize a different sort of criminality. And that, obviously, is the definition of tyranny. Anyway, Absolute immunity, uh, you could probably put absolute monarch in there <laughs> just as easily, co copy and paste, right? Anyway, uh, however, may not apply when a prosecutor is not acting as an officer of the court, but is instead engaged in other tasks, say, investigative or administrative tasks. The analytical key to prosecutorial immunity is whether the actions in question are those of an advocate. Alteration, question marks, and citation omitted. Whether the prosecutor has an improper motive, acts in bad faith, or even acts in an unquestionably legal manner is irrelevant. Boy, don't you just love these people? Own little petty dictators all over the place here. Working together to suppress everyone else and ignore the true law. Plaintiff's allegations against defendant Abigail Saving, including, for example, that she lied at his arraignment and refused to comply with discovery, fall within the scope of prosecutorial immunity. Noting that prosecutorial immunity applies to actions intimately associated with the judicial phase of the criminal process. 
The same is true regarding his allegations pertaining to the criminal investigation as they concern defendant Abigail Savings' offers made during pre-trial negotiations. Knowing that examples of investigative or administrative actions include giving advice to police officers or making a press conference statement or making a statement in application for a warrant. In short, there are no factual allegations in the complaint from which the court could draw the reasonable inference that Ab defendant Abigail Sabian acted as anything other than advocate for the state. Now, here's, here's an interesting part about that document. It appears that the writer of this garbage contradicted themselves when they stated that a person acting as an advocate is not covered by prosecutorial immunity, but then they contradict themselves by saying that, yes, indeed, somebody who's acting as an advocate for the state is covered under prosecutorial immunity. So here they, they just construe this thing in whatever the hell they, way they want because they're they're tyrants, right? They, they do whatever they want. That's literally, that's what a tyrant does. They just, they're just, uh, you know, doing whatever, whatever they want. <laughs> Basically. Sovereign immunity. So save the best for last, obviously. Plaintiff's claims that against the FBI also cannot proceed. And here we get more of this nonsense case law crap. Which are just opinions for, quote, precedent. Or the pre-cessation is what precedent uh, essentially means. Uh, damages from federal agents for injuries inflicted in violation of the individual's Fourth Amendment rights. Such claims are the counterpart to suits under blah 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 against state officials who infringe plaintiffs' federal constitutional or statutory rights. Blah blah blah. Importantly, however, blah blah blah. Because the FBI is a federal agency, plaintiffs' claims against it cannot proceed. So that's interesting that that's what they put under sovereign immunity. The FBI has sovereign immunity. Is that kind of odd, that wording that this writer here put there? Political subdivision immunity. Finally, plaintiff alleges that several individual defendants, as well as the city of Logan, uh, the city neglected, ne negligently retained defendant Mowry more specifically. He alleges that the city failed to fire defendant Mowry after he publicly posted his blah, 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 white supremacist beliefs in the city's policies and procedures should have prevented these violations. <clears throat> it's just more nonsense. Well, of course, naturally what you're dealing with here is a ignorant person who's been brainwashed. At least that is how this document appears. And because you have ignorant an ignorant person who is writing this stuff, they don't understand that they're going to be treated like a subject to this clown kangaroo court garbage that we are uh, forced at gunpoint mainly to adhere to although that hopefully will change soon where the uh, person pointing the guns is more lawful and legitimate so this takes us into the next and more complicated part of this video, which starts with the Sestu QV, or Sestu KV, which, according to Merriam-Webster, is a person whose life measures the duration of an estate, but below it, it, there's a more applicable definition, which is actually translation because it's French, and it says Sestu QV is French like brie cheese and is superior attitude about wine, it means he who lives and refers to a beneficiary of a trust. And that's some really bad humor that that writer put in there. So then we can move on to the Wikipedia article, Sestu K, or Sestu Ake, is a short version of Sestu Ake us le fofement fui fait. Literally, the person whose use slash benefit the fofment was made. So he who he to him to that uses the yeah anyway yeah basically what it said there in modern terms a beneficiary ah uh, that's really annoying that there there that little tag in there is a 
example of them trying to subvert the language where they state in modern terms a beneficiary. First of all, the term beneficiary is not a modern term. And no, not in modern terms a beneficiary. These things might be in the same thing, but sestuke is still a word that is used. It might not be used by them, by the propagandists, but that does not make it any less modern than the term beneficiary. It is here. This is manipulation of the language to make you believe that sestuke is not used anymore, which is a lie. But they're not going to directly say that because it's all about subversion, line without line type of deal, even though it's still a lie because the intent is to mislead. Anyway, it is a law French phrase of medieval English invention. Now, that phrase right there is just pure propaganda, a law French phrase. What does that mean? <laughs> does it mean anything? It's so stupid. And a uh, uh, Middle English invention. No, it was not a middle, medieval English invention because sestuque is French. It's not English. Quite ridiculous. Which appears in the legal phrases sestuque trust, sestuque us, or sestuque v. In contemporary English, and here we go again with this stupid coded language. Contemporary, of course, means current, but it could mean contemporary could mean somebody from the 17th century according to the time period that they're living in, right? They're contemporaries, the people of their time period. It's really stupid. They use this word to look intellectually superior. Uh, anyway, in contemporary English, the phrase is also commonly pronounced setike or sestike, according to Roebuck. And here we go with the stupid citing opinions, as always. Sestike use is pronounced sestike use and sestuke trust, are often interchangeable. In some medieval documents, it is seen as sestuake. In formal legal discourse, it is often used to refer to the relative novelty of trust itself. I didn't love that word there, right? Relative novelty. Ugh. Coded language and attempting to diminish the subject there before that English term became acceptable. It's all about running cover and hiding for criminal activity. That is the basis to all of this. Here in Google again, we get two hits. It says to KV, and notice the owl, the symbol of Athena there, from Ermi.com. says to KV refers to the person on whose life contingency an insurance contract is based. Again, he that him that lives. So, they could, of course, with most of these, they could just translate the French to English, and everybody would understand it instantly. Rejected petition removed outdated, says to QV Act, 1666, and assume, blah, blah, blah. During the Black Plague, Great Files of London, Parliament, again, Parliament, from the French word parlay, or to speak, enacted the Sesti QV Act, 1666, or the Act of Him That Lives. This segregated the rights of men and women. So it's yet another one of these unlawful acts that was established to determine people's rights that can be given and then taken away, of course. And this is nothing new. It's very old, and it was deemed unlawful in the U.S. Constitution for these very purposes. So they just reinstituted the old garbage through uh, subversion and fraud. So this is an interesting context for the, quote, life of a juridic person. According to <laughs> the Catholic Health Association... Don't you like that one? Juridic persons, unlike moral persons, are creations of the law. Well, a law. Not the law, a law. Of course, their law is the law. But their law is not our, the law. So, hence the issues with that word law. And on whose side you claim it, basically. They enable people to come together to perform a work or carry out a mission they would be unable to do on their own. Although juridic persons are represented by individuals, board members, for example, they have perpetual existence. Again, sestu kv, he who lives. A juridic entity that has perpetual existence never dies according to their law. That is a fundamental and important concept to understand when it comes to money laundering and these criminal elements that all work together to retain the powers of their, quote, empire. So, 
if you put in the word juridic nation into Google, you will find the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs. Quote, the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs is the United Nations Office currently administered by Under Secretary General for Legal Affairs and Legal Counsel for the United Nations, Miguel de Serpa Suarez. Notice that. Under Secretary General. That's quite a title, don't you think? So all of this puts into context a specific document that I came across called a guarantee letter, and it was sent to the Comisión Ejecutiva de Atención a Víctimas, which in Spanish is the Executive Commission to, of uh, Attention to Victims, basically. Now that's a direct translation, and it could possibly be translated in a different way that's more palatable for English speakers. But anyway, uh, you should basically understand it's just an uh, Executive Commission for for giving attention to victims, right? Not for victims, but rather to give attention to victims. Kind of like you're raising awareness garbage. So likely a nonprofit, even though it's allegedly part of the government, but then again, government's corporation. So anyway, uh, it states, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Name Removed, in brackets and all caps, this email is forwarded to us from the Office of Comptroller of Currency in Washington, D.C where Michael Chamberlain has been working with the Acting Comptroller of Currency to ensure the immediate disbursement of your funds. Uh, LIC, Andre Vasquez, Director, Director de Coordinación, or Director of Coordination, and again, that same commission. Here's the interesting part. This looks like a copy and paste document, right? When they have the brackets name remove type of deal, that's kind of like copy and paste, right? It, it could just as well say copy and paste right there because that's basically all I have to do. This is a copy and paste document in continuation uh, from International Disbursement and they have the email blanked out but you can kind of tell what it says still. Sent Tuesday, June 2nd, sec- uh, well it just says Tuesday, June, no actual day, 2020 at 6.57 a.m. Subject guarantee letter, dear Mr. and Mrs. again name remo- removed or just copy and paste. Here you will find the guarantee letter, identifying the actions needed to be taken so that we here may ensure the arrival of your international settlement funds to your bank capture line this same week. Again, settlement funds. International settlement funds, mind you. Mr. Name removed, again, you just put copy and paste has informed us of your situation. A guarantee letter is being drafted by name and title removed or copy and paste to assure you of the arrival of these funds and the finalization of this pending international settlement once and for all. The OCC charters, regulates, and supervises all national banks and federal savings associations as well as federal branches and agencies of foreign banks. Don't you like that line there? So they regulate charter and supervise all federal branches and agencies of foreign banks as well as all national banks and federal savings associations yeah i wonder who died and left them in charge of all that (laughs) the occ is an independent bureau of the u.s department of the treasury name and title removed again copy and paste in continuation Notice of deficit due to bracket readjustment regarding Mexico-USA international settlement. This notice is regarding pending international settlement involving the Mexican federal compensation funds legally registered to be received by United States citizens and patriot. Names removed, again copy and paste. Registered under Mexican federal case number, ID number removed. Copy and paste. The interesting part of that paragraph right there is that it talks about something being legally registered, mainly being the Mexican Federal Compensation Funds. Now, it does appear that those funds are plural funds, and there's not a single fund using all upper uppercase letters funds, making it a single fund, and that's just the copy and paste name. So, these this would be actually talking about multiple funds, instead of, you know, like I said, just one fund. But those funds would be, quote, legal entities that are legally registered, right? In preparation for the global currency reset and arrival of the quantum financial system currently running parallel, 
any international financial activity regulated by their respective agencies must strictly comply with no tolerance to all protocol and regulations stipulated in the International Quantum Initiative Act. I don't know what that is, but that's interesting because what they're attempting to do, it appears, is create a situation where they can continue launder, laundering ill-gotten gains, but while complying with the no tolerance to all protocol and regulations stipulated and blah, blah, blah. So it's still along those same lines of appearing to follow the law while actually breaking it, basically, right? How do you uh, adhere to the doctrine or the policy or the wording or the thing set forth, but still get away with what you want to get away with, right? That's the idea there. That's what you always find in these types of wordings, how to comply, but also not, <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't need to stipulate that. Anyway, passed by the U.S. House of Representatives and approved by the U.N. and USMCA. Notice that, right? Approved by the U.N. You have something passed by the U.S. House of Representatives, and that is not a law until it has been approved by the U.N. and the USMCA, which tells you, of course, that the USMCA is, in fact, an entity of its own, formerly known as NAFTA. And... I don't remember what USMCA stands for, but I know NAFTA stands for North American Free Trade Agreement because I've heard that name way too often. This means all financial obligations involved in the finalization of this and any other international settlement must be satisfied in full and specifically by the registered beneficiary. We'll get into what a registered beneficiary is later. In this case being, names removed again, copy-paste, an audit performed by the International Organization of Supreme Audit Institutions, INTOSI. Notice that wording there. International organization, so like an NGO, of supreme audit institutions, revealed seemingly innocently overlooked deficit caused by the before-mentioned international settlement moving into a new bracket limit requiring a readjustment of certain financial obligations when the cost differs depending on the bracket in which it currently fits. Below is a table showing the financial obligations required by the federal government of Mexico, which depend on bracket limits and the bracket limits affected. The following table shows the requirements for the settlement's new bracket limit in comparison to the prior bracket, prior bracket limit and the remainder due for the finalization of the pending international settlement. Partially satisfied, oblig satisfied obligations deficit. Beneficiary has come to an agreement with the necessary governmental entities Strangely, governmental is lowercase g. Total amount due to conciliate the deficit, 13,845 USD. Names removed, probably co copy and paste, although it looks like the O in removed is actually a D, which is interesting. Is hereby notified of the de deficit on this international settlement. The monetary vehicle of this settlement funds has been retained in transit transit number, blah, blah, blah. Interestingly, that's that's left in, right? The transit number is left in. Everything else is removed, but the transit number is left in. And will be retained until the before-mentioned deficit conciliation amount has been satisfied in full and only by the registered beneficiary. Names removed. International Financial Statutes. Wow, and that's spelled really oddly. S T A T. U-E-T-T-E-S. It's uh, more similar to the French spelling, actually, than the English, it, despite the fact that it probably originates from French, and, and of course French originates from another source, so, so on and so forth. Uh, anyway, financial statutes limit the length of time international monetary vehicles can be retained before being returned to their place of origin and the initial transaction being canceled. The length of the time permitted by OFAC, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, Right, This document, allegedly coming from a sovereign, sovereign entity of the United States government, is referencing the fact that it needs overall approval from the UN, and it's referencing the length of time that's permitted by the Office of Foreign Assets Control. Not, say, the U.S. Office, but the Office of Foreign Assets Control. How much would you want to bet that that's a UN outfit? 
anyway, to pay the deficit of an international monetary vehicle already in transit. It's five business days after the notification of the parties involved in this case being Wednesday, June 17th, 2020. I, name and title removed, hereby certify that the Comptroller of Currency, pursuant to revised statutes 324 at SEC, as amended in 12 U.S.C. 1 and at SEC, as amended, has possession, custody, and control of all records pertaining to the chartering, regulation, and supervision of all national and foreign banking associations pertaining to international pending settlement destined for disbursement to beneficiaries being U.S. citizens. Names removed after the payment of the de deficit discovered after the audit ordered by collaborations of Ferrer, Abogados, y Asociados, and conducted by the Intosai. Ferrer, Abogados, and Asociados would easily be translated to Ferrer, Lawyers, and Associates into English, even though Abogado means advocate. What we have are not advocates, and again, av Abogados in Spanish, the ones that we have today aren't advocates either. They do not actually advocate for the people they're pretending to advocate for. Instead, they advocate for their own interests and those of their little clubs and groups. So, in a sense, they're advocates, but they're not really advocates in the way that word is commonly associated to mean misdirection uh, and uh, it's, it's lying, but it's, it's the uh, usual sort of misleading, so you can say you're not technically lying. Anyway, two beneficiaries, names removed, will no matter, will, no matter what circumstances may come to be, be funded their proposed settlement amount of 57,434.33 USD and immediately afterwards be refunded the current and finan final financial obligations of 13,845 USD. Now, here's the interesting part, right? The audit was ordered by collaborations of lawyers in Mexico and conducted by the so-called INTOSI, the International Organization of Supreme Audit, whatever, retards or idiots or whatever you want to call them because I mean they're corrupt people so they're not exactly choosing the right side anyway they're stating that the amount of money is going to be sent regardless of what circumstances may come to be so let's say somebody comes along and says you can't do this it's a criminal act you are taking money that's not yours and paying it to people who have no authority or right to that money. Well, they're basically stating that it's going to happen one way or the other. Period. Money laundering, right? In testimony whereof, today, June 16, 2020, I have hereunto subscribed my name and caused my seal of office to be affixed to these presents at the U.S. Department of Treasury in the city of Washington, District of Columbia. So, let's go ahead and look at the case Cobell v. Salazar. Uh, from Wikipedia, Cobell v. Salazar, previously Cobell v. Kempthorne, and Cobell v. Norton, Cobell v. Babbitt, is a class action lawsuit brought by uh, Luis Cobell in parentheses Blackfeet, although I, I would very much doubt her actual legitimate affiliation to any sort of American Indian nation especially considering its states and other Native American representatives in 1996 against two departments of the United States government, the Department of the Interior and the Department of the Treasury, for mismanagement of Indian trust funds. Right? Mismanagement of Indian trust funds. It was settled in 2009. The plaintiffs claim that the U.S. government has incorrectly accounted for the income of Indian trust assets which are legally owned by the Department of the Interior, but held in trust for individual Native Americans, the beneficial owners. All right. A couple things here. First of all, it states legally owned by the Department of the Interior. Not lawfully owned, but legally owned. As in owned in name, as in they claim ownership of these trust assets which are not actually theirs. They do not own them. But, according to this Wikipedia article, they were legally owned by them. They were held in trust for individual, quote, Native Americans, the beneficial owners, or a more proper way to say that would be the beneficiaries. The reason why they don't say the beneficiaries is because this money 
was unlawfully stolen, right? Not mismanaged, stolen. And both sides working together to suppress the fact that they committed a crime. Every person involved in this garbage committed a crime of theft. They used their positions of authority to steal that which was not theirs, and then they made money pretending to fix the theft. Anyway, the case was filed in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. No surprise there. The original complaint asserted no claims for mismanagement of the trust assets, since such claims could only be properly asserted in the United States Court of Federal Claims. Yeah, that's, of course, according to their sandbox, because this is all about money laundering. The case is sometimes reported as the largest class action lawsuit against the U.S. in history, but this is disputed. Plaintiffs contend that the number of class members is around 500,000, while defendants maintain it closer to 250,000. The potential liability for the U.S. government in the case is also disputed. Plaintiffs, has, plaintiffs have suggested a figure as high as $176 billion, and defendants have suggested a number in the low billions at most. But as you remember from the previous court case, these people are held free of liability in all cases because of all of this immunity nonsense, right? You can't hold these people accountable for misdeeds because they were acting in official capacity and therefore are immune from all claims being brought against them, especially when it comes to these kangaroo courts. Or I, I don't, I'm not sure what a better better label for them would be, but they're definitely criminals, right? These people are conspirators in criminal conduct in violations of the articles and amendments, the applicable ones anyway, of the U.S. Constitution, the supreme law of the land. Anyway, the case was settled for $3.4 billion in 2009. $1.4 billion was allocated to be paid to the plaintiffs and $2 billion allocated to repurchase fractionated land interests from those distributed under the Dawes Act and to return it to the reservations and communal tribal ownership. Notice that term there, right? Reservations, as in to reserve something for a later date, and communal tribal ownership. Juridic entities, right? This, this money was given to juridic entities. That's how the money laundering works. It's shell corporations and other so-called legal persons moving money around so that it's hard to track. In addition, a scholarship fund, again, nonprofit juridic entity, for, quote, Native American and Alaska, Alaska Native students was created. Not American Indians, but, quote, Native American and Alaska Native, or Alaska Native, was created to be funded from purchases of fractionated lands. It is named the Cobell Educational Scholarship Fund, in honor, of lead, in honor of lead plaintiff Eloise Cobell. Yeah, somehow I doubt all of that stuff is entirely true. It's partially true, as always, but not entirely. It's worded in a way to subvert the truth. So they can speak in code and the rest of us think they're saying something that they're not. Anyway, who filed suit against the government in 1996 and persisted with the case until settlement. The scholarship fund has a cap of $60 million. $40 million had been contributed to the fund by November 2016. By November 2016, the Department of Interior had paid $900 million to individual land or, blah, 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 landholders for the fair market value of their fractionated lands and transferred an estimated 1.7 million acres to tribal reservations for communal use. Right? Tribal reservations for communal use. As more reservations are participated in the program, the pace of buyback has increased. There's a couple things to note here. First of all, that it's stating the Department of Interior paid money to individual landholders. It doesn't specify what type of individual landholders, whether or not they're human beings or whether or not they're companies. And it's also stating the Department of Interior paid, right? A juridic entity, a, co a corporation, a company, an agency, whatever you want to call it, that paid money. How does a fictional entity pay anything? That's an interesting 
thing to look at. Not only that, the most important thing about this is that the money, mo a lot large portion of the money, was given to a nonprofit. Doesn't directly state it was a nonprofit, but I expect it was because it's a scholarship fund, which are usually listed as nonprofit. And that previous document perfectly brings us to the subject of settling a trust, right? That first court case was about so quote unquote mismanagement of trust funds, right? This right here is all about settling a trust and this corrupt, despicable individual, Eloise Cobell, if that even was her, is her real name. She could just be an actor for all we know. Well, she reached a settlement. So, a settlement in trust law is a deed, also called a trust instrument, whereby real estate land or other property is given by settlor, settler, settlor, into trust, so the beneficiary has the limited right to the property, for example, during their life, but usually has no right to sell, bequeath, or otherwise transfer it. And remember, a juridic entity has a perpetual life. So here we come to the U.S. Code uh, 1063, uh, Obstruction of Settlement on or Transit over Public Land. No person, and I'm not sure, I believe that considering the date of this is February 25th, 1885, that the person they're probably referring to is supposed to be a natural person because they had not yet come up with this garbage nonsense about juridic persons and personhood and legal personhood and all this other garbage. But no person by force, threats, intimidation, or by any fencing or enclosing or any other unlawful means... Notice that any other unlawful means, which law are they referring to? It cannot be the U.S. Constitution. That does not align with the U.S. Constitution. Anyway, unlawful means shall prevent or obstruct or shall combine and confederate with others to prevent or obstruct any person from peaceably entering upon or establishing a settlement or residence on any tract of public land subject to settlement or entry under the public land laws of the United States. Now, remember that court case, it had to do with land, fractionable land, right? Fractionary land or whatever it said. Settlement of trust. These words, they mean things. They have to do with the laundering of ill-gotten gains, and they're set up by people that wrote all this crap. So they know what they're doing with the, the word games anyway. So it's very important to notice the words land, settlement, and trust. And uh, in continuation, or entry under the public land laws of the United States, or shall prevent or obstruct, of course, remember the public land laws of the United States, not of the U.S. Constitution, but of the United States. This, this thing is running completely parallel to the U.S. Constitution, the supreme law of land, because they are, they're ignoring it. It is not their law. They're only pretending it is or shall prevent or obstruct free passage or transit over or through the public lands, juridic public, provided this section shall not be held to affect the right of or title of persons who have gone upon, improved, or occupied said lands under the land laws of the United States, claiming title thereto in good faith. Now let's move on to a later work, uh, titled under State Lands Generally, ORS, that would be the Oregon Revised Code. We have the... or. Oregon Revised Statute. In Ohio, we have the or Ohio Revised Code. So, pretty similar, ORS, ORC. 273.910, confirmation of title to state lands purchased before 1918. In all cases prior to May 21st, 1917, where state deeds were issued to lands claimed by this state under the laws of the United States. So, again, not lands claimed under the laws of the U.S. Constitution, or law, singular, of the U.S. Constitution, but rather the laws, plural, of the United States. The legal title to which had not yet vested in the state at the date of such deeds, the after-acquired title of the state in or to such lands shall be deemed, again, that wording, right, shall be deemed vested in such purchases who purchase such lands in good faith 
and their heirs and assigns from time such legal title passed or may pass out of the United States. Nothing in this section shall prevent the state of Oregon from proceeding at any time to set aside on the ground of fraud any deed made by the state, nor shall anything contained in this section be deemed to prejudice the rights of any person claiming title to any public land adversely to the state of Oregon or to the United States. So here, if we're looking at this and we take in context the aforementioned cases and quote unquote uh, precedents or pre cessation, the uh, examples of evidence um, originally stated in this video, right? You could have a purchaser of the United States who is deemed vested and has done their purchase apparently in good faith under legal title, not lawful title, legal title. And then the United States or whatever department agency or whatever other nonsense entity does it which of course holds uh, removes culpability and liability from the individual that perpetuated the crime, right? The prosecutorial uh, agent or the judicial officer or any of these other stupid titles that they pass around like candy. Well, that person intentionally quote mismanages the purchase. It goes to somebody else and disappears and nothing can be done about it except hold a uh, fraudulent court case in which uh, more money is stolen and then laundered through these schemes. So here we get to the definitions that tie these things all together. Remember, the money from that settlement of Cobell, as the alleged name of the individual is, was laundered through a nonprofit, right? According to the FDIC, beneficiaries must be eligible. The rules provide that a deposit can be insured as a revocable trust account, right? So the insurance is a revo revocable trust account. If either the revocable trust instrument or the deposit account records identify and designate an eligible beneficiary. An el eligible beneficiary must be one of the following. A natural person, in parentheses, human being, B a charitable organization, right? Like an educational foundation that is recognized as such under the Internal Revenue Co Code. Not, of course, under the Constitution. The Constitution, as for, per the context of the time period, would have recognized a natural person, human being, as that entity. This other extrapolation into juridic entities and whatnot as, and algorithmic entities and all that stuff is relatively new when compared to the time period. That person that originally wrote the first document in French would likely have had little concept and clearly was not referencing any sort of juridic entities because they specifically referred to companies, committees, organizations, and other things, not as persons, but as they are. Anyway, the last one, C, a nonprofit entity that is recognized as such under the Internal Revenue Code. Also, according to the FDIC, for informal revocable trust accounts, the depositor or account holder is the owner of the account. For formal revocable trust accounts, the owner is usually referred to as a settler, right, like a settlement, Trustor, grantor, donor, maker, or creator of the trust. Often, an owner can be a trustee, but trustee or successor trustee designations are irrelevant for purposes of calculating deposit insurance coverage. Now, I know I don't believe that I have any documents here referencing trustees, but there are quite a lot of nonprofit corporations that reference the trustees, which of course has to do with this very topic here and the movement of funds. Well, before we move on to this other thing, I should note in that part before that it would be the movement of value and assets in general, not necessarily funds, because the word fund isn't really used in the same way it might have been in the past nowadays. I mean, sure, the average person might use the word funds when they're talking about the collection of resources, but considering funds could also mean multiple uh, uh, fund, trust funds and things like that, it, it kind of takes on a different meaning. And so for the 
uh, desire of accuracy or want of accuracy, it'd be better to say the movement of assets, uh, things like land and stuff of value, right? Like gold, silver, currency, cash, well, the currency we have today is debatable about the value, but anyway, you go. I mean, anyway, I hope. <laughs> anyway, um, on Google, right, there's a, another angle to this sort of you scratch my back, I scratch yours type of thing, but more like you have a club of people and they all work together to move around things not just about laundering money, but it's also about laundering like land titles, stuff of value, right? And so you'll get it on one end, but it always goes back the other way, right? So you can't have settlements of all of these funds going to one area without it being returned and and recycled through the system. So that's where you get into these things called corporate integrity agreements, right? It's this firm settled a federal fraud suit, then got a $45 million bailout. So there you go. That's a instant evidence of the sort of movement of the funds don't really mean anything, right? They're just moving stuff around. They're, they're laundering money. As part of the settlement, they entered into the corporate integrity agreements with the department's inspector general. That in part requires them retain an independent body and blah, blah, blah. Detroit area hospital system to pay $845 million to settle. Again, here we get a juridic entity pain a fictitious entity doing the act of pain which should only be something possible for a human person to be able to do a company should not be able to pay anything somebody an agent for the company they're the ones that pay it not the company itself that of course has to do with the liability and ironically it's this is in addition to resolving false claims act liability resolving liability. Beaumont has entered into a five-year corporate integrity agreement with the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General, which includes, among other things, an arrangements review to be conducted by an independent review organization. Independent review organization. Naturally vague. Novartis Settlements and Corporate Integrity Agreement 2020 version 3.0. The new corporate integrity agreement contemporaneous with settling the FCA claims Novartis entered into a corporate integrity agreement with the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General, HHS OIG. Among many things, the CIA requires that Novartis significantly reduce its paid speaker programs and the blah, blah, blah. UHS, for profits like hospitals, $132 million payout, payout over DOJ and MA fraud. So, again, more examples. They, they give money and all of these fake fines and all this other stuff. And that resolves them or absolves them of liability. Kind of like you go to church and you pay somebody and they absolve you of your sins, right? It's the same idea. Of course, that stuff goes back around where then they give money to their friends in court settlements and that money goes into a settlement. It settles a trust and goes into another fund, basically. Anyway, uh... UHS entered into a corporate integrity agreement for five years and includes maintaining an independent monitor of its behavioral practices and complaints to legislators about the for-profit psychiatric industry. CCHHR has faulted the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services CMS correction plans. And of course, remember uh, or notice the corporate integrity agreement is the CIA which are letters that also correlate to the so-called Central Intelligence Agency. Anyway, Daichi Sankyo Settlement and Corporate Integrity Agreement. Daichi Sankyo Settlement and Corporate Integrity Agreement, Japanese pharmaceutical company, Daichi Sankyo, Inc., with U.S. headquarters in New Jersey, has agreed to pay $339 million to resolve allegations that it violated the False Claims Act. So here, here you're wondering, right, how was it that all of these so-called government entities that nobody wants around, that have no legitimate lawful authority to operate, how is it they keep operating? Here's the reason why. They are established, they're stable, and they're, quote, too big to fail. They have all of these different ways to raise capital, capital to keep working. Then we get into... Another court case, this one is with the U.S. Supreme Court, and it's an opinion, as always. 
This has to do with a particular case that is clearly the same instance of both parties being corrupt, right? If you look into the case, neither of the people involved are particularly um, devoid of liability, but it's clearly a scheme that is being formed, and it's usually obvious when there's no references to the Constitution, right? They, they barely, very, barely, very rarely reference the U.S. Constitution because that's not their law. Anyway, um, the IRS also may serve a summons to collect any such liability, right? So they're collecting liability. It's interesting wording. These summons can extend to third parties beyond the taxpayer under investigation. Accordingly, the IRS may request the production of books, papers, records, or other data from any person who's, who possesses information concerning a delinquent taxpayer. Right? Books, papers, records, or other data. What is that other data? It's the interesting part. Well, I mean, there's many interesting parts, but it's particularly a concerning one. Given the breadth of this power, Congress has imposed certain safeguards. Yeah. Somehow I doubt that. It'd be more like safeguards for their, themselves, for all their friends, not for us. They don't safeguard us. That's the end of that sentence. Safeguards for themselves. The IRS must generally give notice of the summons to any person, dot, 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 identified in the summons. Anyone entitled to notice can bring a motion to quash the summons. And in the Internal Revenue, Revenue Code provides district courts with jurisdiction to hear and determine any proceeding concerning a motion to quash, thereby waiving the sovereign immunity of the United States. Here we get that word again, sovereign immunity. However, they do not reference the United States as a sovereign who establishes privilege. Instead, the sovereign immunity is a right that can be waived. It is, in fact, in itself a privilege, which is not the true context of a sovereign as we referenced in the first document. How they refer to these entities in the context is very important. There are, however, exceptions to the notice requirement. As relevant, rev, relevant, the IRS need not provide notice to a person who is identified in the summons if the summons is issued in aid of the collection of an assessment made or judgment rendered against the person with respect to whose liability the summons is issued. So they're issuing a summons based off of liability. And as these games are always played, the liabilities always is shifted away from the corrupt criminals that are violating the law, the true law, in every sense of the word, because they're pretending through this fictitious system that they, in fact, will admit to if they are forced. But it doesn't really stop them, because it all has to do with practicality. And who's, who's really uh, threatening, right? Who's backing it up with force? Anyway, the liability at law or in equity of any transferee or fiduciary of any person referred to in clause uh, I. So here I have summarized this concept and idea of what they do into the best and most palatable way that I could think of under the fictitious court settlement title, which I believe fictitious court settlement scheme would probably be better, but either way, the fictitious court settlement uh, involves one, transfer of monies, or essentially things of value, to a trust has to be done with a natural person, charity, or nonprofit listed for insuring, right? According to the FDIC definitions there. Two, the lawyer is named as beneficiary to whole a settler pays into a trust, which is executed by the judge, a banking priest, or robed, robed noblesse administrator. That is the position they hold within this sandbox of the sovereign, the Vatican Code and UN regulations that they enforce, right? They always go back to the UN, and then whenever the Vatican's involved in something, they always reference the powers of the sovereign. Not sovereign immunity, not a privilege, a right, none of that. No, the the sovereign, the interests of the sovereign. 
that's how they reference it when it comes to the quote Roman pontiff and so these people they are nobles the robed noblesse right they love to wear their courtly robes and all that stuff right they're the robed noblesse they're the nobles of the sovereign the Roman pontiff moving on we come to the Camp Lejeune water contamination settlement amounts and payouts 2023 Camp Lejeune water contamination settlement amounts that could be well over 1 million to as low as 25,000. Camp Lejeune lawsuit settlement payouts for contaminated water exposure is estimated to be over 6.7 billion. All laundered money, of course. Victims who pursue a Camp Lejeune toxic water claim will receive lucrative settlements. Those would be your juridic entities, of course, and your... Um, willing participants in the quote legal mechanism anyway which could be well over one million in many some cases camp lejeune lawsuit payout per person would depend on the severity of the disease and cancer of the victim the camp lejeune settlement amounts will depend on the nature of the illness medical condition or harm caused to the victim in all likelihood victims who endure tragic conditions such as cancer adult leukemia kidney cancer liver cancer or parkinson's disease will be offered right offered more settlement funds for compensation than victims who were diagnosed with less serious medical problems resulting from the water. Of course, naturally, they're not going to say paid. Now, they would use the excuse that it, you can't say paid until the settlement has been reached. But the truth to that is that no individual human being, other than maybe the salaries for the lawyers, will actually receive anything substantial for these things. It will all go into settlement funds. Remember, here it states, will be offered more settlement funds for compensation. The wording there is important. It has to do with trust funds and the settlement of a trust. In continuation, the above amounts are our estimate for average per victim Camp Lejeune water contamination settlement amounts. Our lawyers believe these payout expectations are reasonable. If a victim goes to trial on a catastrophic injury case and wins in front of a jury, again from the French jurar to promise, the jury Camp Lejeune payouts could be between $1 million to $10 million or more, right? Enticing you with that money that you're never going to see a dime of. And if you do, it, it won't be very much. Of course, a bit, five bucks or something. Our attorneys believe the most lucrative settlements will be won by high powered law firms with financial resources and experience to take the Camp Lejeune claims to a jury trial. And of course, those would be the people most corrupt and most complicit in money laundering, as always. Now, how will the government determine Camp Lejeune water lawsuit settlements? The Justice Department and or Navy JAG lawyers are likely to set up a settlement grid pr premised on objective factors. And here they go over complicating these things as always to try to hide what they're really doing. Camp Lejeune water lawsuits are political matters. That's a declaration right there. No, they're not political matters. Depends on what way you're using that word, I suppose. I mean, yeah, they do matter to the politique or the people. Again, we get more word games here. The United States government is involved as the defendant. A rational and fair settlement grid would need to be set up. And of course, it's the United States government. It's not the individuals that intentionally contaminated the water or did any of these other things. No, it's the faceless juridic entity. That's, uh, that's exactly the type of justice that you'd expect in these kangaroo courts uh, that recognize the legal personhood of juridic entities. Uh, fictitious yeah, fiction theory they're all fictitious so these types of settlement grids are widely utilized in global mass tort settlements in all likelihood the grid will delineate certain medical conditions diseases and cancers into categories such as presumptive conditions non-presumptive cancers etc the government is likely to set up a team of settlement administrators who apply the settlement grid to the facts of a particular claim and generate a settlement offer the government is likely to set a settlement amount or a settlement range for each category depending on the severity of the medical condition the government uppercase g may establish dozens of enhancements and discounts to the camp lejeune settlement amounts for each category Enhan enhancements of proposed settlement amounts could include such factors as now we go on to a different case this one involving trucking companies 
large trucking companies, which are obviously, as always, defrauding the truckers and the, well, the customers, the relative general body of human being customers, not the Dritic customers, of course, because that word takes on a different meaning as well when you put it in context of these fictitious court arrangements and uh, settlement programs and all that. In accordance with the final approval order, the court, this is the, uh, I believe it's Northern District of California, or either way it's in California, and um, they leverage jurisdiction over everyone as always. The court hereby approves the settlements, including attorney's fees of 25% of total 2000 or 2 million 125,000 settlement amount, i.e. 531 thousand two hundred fifty litigation costs in the total amount of four hundred and seventy three thousand six hundred twenty nine point eight seven service awards in the amount of one thousand five hundred to each of the four named plaintiffs settlement administration costs in the amount of three hundred thousand five hundred and the w the lwda's share of the allocated paga penalties in the amount of thirty seven thousand five hundred so a lot of money being laundered there basically the court hereby orders the settlement administrator to distribute the individual settlement amounts to participating class members in accordance with the provision of the settlement agreements. The court finds that all of the notice requirements of Class Action Fairness Act, CAFA, set forth in 28 U.S.C. 1715 have been satisfied. Defendant CRST International Inc. and CRST Expedited Inc. promulgated the notice required by CAFA on November 4, 2022. Defendant CRE England, Inc. promulgated a notice required by CAFA on November 2, 2022. Any checks paid to settlement class members shall advise that they will remain valid and negotiable for 180 calendar days from the date of their issuance and may thereafter automatically be canceled if not cashed by a settlement class member within that time, at which time the settlement class member's check will be deemed void and have no further force and effect. Any settlement class member's failure to negotiate and or cash any such check will not abrogate or affect the settlement class member's releases pursuant to the settlements. Funds associated with any checks which are not timely negotiated will pay to an appropriate Cypress beneficiary. Here's a lot of things going on in this. First of all, this thing sets up for them to be able to mismanage the check and it doesn't arrive. And the liability, according to this order, is placed entirely on the person to whom the check is supposed to be sent. And the reason why it will only remain available for 120 days is because after that, they're going to move the funds on to somewhere else. Money laundering. Following entry of this final judgment, the court will dismiss the settling defendants from this action with prejudice. Although the settling defendants will be dismissed from this action with prejudice, the court shall maintain continuing jurisdiction over the settling defendants and the settlement funds for purposes of enforcing the terms of the settlements. The final approval order and this final judgment and or making further orders regarding this dispersal of funds associated with uncashed settlement checks notwithstanding the entry of the dismissal order and final judgment. That use of the word notwithstanding, I don't know what context they're using it in, but that phrase is supposed to mean that it does not have standing and it also means that you don't have to mention it because it has no standing in addition this part of the order is declaring continuing jurisdiction they love how these petty dictators always love to do this where they they love to state this thing where you're their subjects and you'll always be their subjects and you can't do anything about it and it's all your own fault you just love the way they do that. It's so contemptuous. It's amazing. It's just, it is pure spitefulness towards anyone that's not a part of their little club. Final judgment is hereby entered on the settlement as to the settling defendants without affecting the finality of this final approval order and final judgment in any way. That's a phrase for you. Without affecting the finality of this final approval order and final judgment in any way. This court hereby retains continuing jurisdiction over the interpretation, right? Jurisdiction over the interpretation, implementation, and enforcement of the settlement. Settlement agreements and all orders and judgments entered into connection therewith. So, of course, they can interpret these things in any way they want because they have just declared themselves having continuing jurisdiction. 
And if they interpret whatever that continuing jurisdiction pertains to, then they can Im impose themselves and impede anything they want, as long as it's interpreted as belonging to their continuing jurisdiction of the settlement. The court further finds, under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 54B, that there is no just reason for delay and therefore directs that the dismissal of defendant CR England, Inc., CRST International, Inc., and CRST Expedited, Inc. shall be final. Again, here we go again with a stupid word. Notwithstanding the dismissal of the settling defendants. So why do you need to mention it if it has no standing? The court retains continuing jurisdiction over the plaintiffs and the settling defendants and the settlement funds for purposes of effectuating settlement agreements and distributing the settlement fund. After settlement administration has been completed in accordance with settlement agreements and in no event later than November 30th, 2023, after the date on which all individual settlements funds have been mailed to the class members and the check cashing deadline has expired. Notice that, right? It's all about the mailing and the expiration of the checks. I guarantee you that any monies that they, well, unless they decide to go back on, I mean, I doubt that my video is going to have any impact for that, but if they do actually end up deciding to mail it, from the wording in here, it appears that they are actually planning on mismanaging the forms and checks to be cashed so that they can then move that money on and then, Oh, well, too bad. It's your fault because you exist and they're, you're their subject and they don't like you. Period. Plaintiffs shall file a report with this court certifying compliance with the terms of each respective settlement agreement and proposing appropriate actions to be taken for any remaining funds due to uncashed settlement checks. Now, of course, when I say you, I'm also referring to myself because I am a part of the quote-unquote human public that they dislike. It is so ordered, dated February 23rd, 2023. Stanley Blumenfield, Jr., United States District Judge. Now, this comes from the settlement notice, and it is as you'd expect. Quote, your legal rights are affected whether you act or don't act. See, now they're declaring your liability. Like, you might not even get this summons, and you're just automatically liable. It's, it's amazing. Please read this notice carefully. You may do nothing or any of the following by sending your written request to the settlement administrator. Ask to be excluded, opt out. Your legal rights and options. Remove yourself from the settlements and receive no payments or benefits from the settlements. Keep your right to sue or continue to sue settling defendants for the claims resolved in this case, postmark January 13, 2023. Now, I received one of these notices and I wrote back to the people that had sent me the notice, the lawyers. But I guarantee, considering I got no response back, that they would say that it wasn't... Uh, now, it wasn't valid because I didn't send it to the, quote, settlement administrator, even though they gave absolutely no details about who that is or where I could send anything to. And, of course, they do all this stuff so that they can claim things on my behalf without my consent and launder money in my name. So they could then, again, press liability onto me for their crimes, as they always love to do. The court provisionally certified a settlement class of the following three groups of individuals. The CRST antitrust subclass, all current and former drivers under contract as motor vehicle carrier drivers with the CS CRST International Inc., CRST Expedited Inc., Sierra England Inc., Western Express Inc., Schneider National Carriers Inc., Southern Refrigerated Transport Inc., The Covenant Transport Inc., Pashal Truck Lines Inc., Stevens Transport Inc. at any time from May 15th, 2020, 2013 through April 1st, 2022. Right? They just declared all current and former drivers. That under contract thing is up to their whatever they want to think or say under contract means. But either way, they declared all current and former drivers. CRST Labor Code subclass, all persons who, one, signed a pre-employment driver training agreement and or driver employment contract with CRST International Inc. and or CST Expedited Inc., the CRST defendants, participated in the CRST defendants driver training program in California and three were charged for their U.S. Department of Transportation DOT physical, DOT drug test, administrative fees, and or the 3950 or 6500 contract fee after failing to complete their contractually required 8-10 to 10 month employment term at any time between May 15, 2013 through April 1st, 2022. 
See our England settlement class, all current and former drivers under contract. Again, that's up for their interpretation, as usual. As motor vehicle carrier drivers with CRST International Inc., CRST Expedited Inc., CR England Inc., Western Express Inc., Schneider National Carriers Inc., Southern Refrigerated Transport Inc., and blah, 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 same people. So... That's interesting. They make declarations over all people so that they can commit crimes in their name, charge them uh, liable under the crimes they just committed, and also ensure that no justice ever gets served for all the crimes that are perpetuated against these people in the first place. That's the justice you can expect from these fraudulent, fictitious courts that parade themselves around and run around under the guise of following the U.S. Constitution while robbing everyone blind and then transporting it to all of their corrupt beneficiaries, lawyers, attorneys in other countries. And they do all of this under our noses, no less. So, here to clarify some of these things, let's go ahead and look at some thesis papers written by the entry, the, the people that are desiring to ent enter this club of the corrupt, at least as a sort of noble servant sort of level. This comes from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Beyond Illusion, a juridical genealogy of consent in criminal and medical law. So those are two so-called laws that are being stated there by Carla Maureen O'Regan. Abstract. Consent is a concept used frequently and with great significance in a wide array of legal fields. It serves to regulate relationships, legitimize authority, delimit normality, and entrench idealized ways of being in the world. That is a very truthful statement. Indeed, consent does serve to regulate relationships, legitimize authority, delimit normality, and entrench idealized ways of being in the world. However, the way that they're phrasing that is uh, very screwy because there's coded language going on here, of course. Yet, despite the consequence of these functions, there is very little precision within legal scholarship about just what consent is. Few investigations of its definitional content depart from presumptive statements about personal autonomy. So here it appears they're coming in the context of what consent means for a non-personal autonomy. So. Well, again, the, the word person, right? Which personal are they talking about? Juridic personal? It did state juridical genealogy. These associations are often described as the common sense of consent and serve to secure a fun foundationalist discourse about what consent is, rendering affirmative conceptions of its meaning or functions unintelligible. This is perhaps best evidence in more critical approaches to consent, where despite widespread acknowledgement of the concept as a legal and political fiction... Its status as a signifier of autonomy is maintained. Despite widespread acknowledgement of the concept as a legal and political fiction, this person is stating there is widespread acknowledgement that consent is a legal and political fiction. That's a statement right there. This creates an imperative to move beyond the notion of consent as merely an illusion to an understanding of it's something more operative. Not only does the story of autonomy that is told about consent obscure the social realities of inequality, difference and subordination that might threaten a notion of a homogeneous citizenry. That sounds like somebody's talking about eugenics. And thus, governmental action made in its name. But it also conceals the historically specific conditions of existence which have brought consent's common sense story of autonomy into being. This thesis explores how this dominant narrative of consent, while producing certain ideal subjectivities, also necessarily produces the subjectivities which don't fall within the ambit of consent. Right? Ideal subjectivities. 
this could have been taken straight from one of the eugenics works of someone like David Rockefeller, or, uh, Margaret Singer, or that other person from the uh, the modest proposal about eating people. Moreover, this project asks what is achieved when the meaning of consent is positioned as a matter of common sense. What does its apparent transparency keep obscure? In contrast to conventional approaches to consent, this project positions consent as a historical artifact rather than a concept within doctrinal, cognitive, or commutative certainty and seeks to investigate its operations across legal fields rather than strictly within them. So that's an interesting note right there. See, it's not... It's deciding and declaring that it's not going to, that it's only going to look at it as a historical artifact. Consent as something that is outdated, basically. This includes an examination of consent to sex, the doctrine of informed consent, and mer medical jurisprudence. See, so not the doctrine of informed consent in practice or tradition or any of that stuff, but rather in jurisprudence, and that, of course, is the way that they use that word not necessarily where it comes from in the context that it might have been used in the, quote, historical artifact context. And the defense of consent to assault in professional sporting contexts. Further, the project engages in a juridical genealogy of consent, studying its use in three vastly different historical periods in search of how it might perform different socio-political functions than understanding of its role within contemporary medical and criminal law suggested should. How these counter-narratives of consent serve to challenge the dominant autonomy story are investigated for what they reveal about the frames of cultural and legal intelligibility at work in consent law today. Now, it should note, I don't have any idea what the motive behind this writer is. All I know is that this paper is being published inside of a highly dogmatic and controlled system, which will instantly turn against anyone who appears to be violating their narrative because they're all corrupt people they all work together they're all complicit and therefore they all understand what happens when they lose if they lose they all lose because they are all complicit in some very heinous activity and therefore they are very hostile when it comes to somebody who appears to be against them now, I don't know what the motive behind the person writing this is, but if they're a bad person, well, they're just entering their own field of, of well, like-minded individuals. But if they're a good person, I would rather not blow their cover. And so I'll just leave it as I have absolutely no idea what the motive behind the person actually publishing this is. But on the surface, of course, it will appear like a work of corruption. So looking back into the U.S. code, we get under a, the um, Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, quote, well, acquisition of future easements B, whenever after a conveyance has been made by this act or under the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, 43 U.S.C. 1601 at SEC, the secretary determines that an easement not reserved at the time of conveyance or by operation of subsection A, that word, reserved, as in a reservation, having to do with land, is very important. Especially when it comes to the abuses against American Indians and violation of their sovereignty, of the sovereign. And the violation, obviously, is the same thing as if you violated the sovereign in 17th century France. It is not... A light thing to do as it's treated today obviously the Roman pontiff doesn't like it when people thumb their nose at him and his corrupted structure that rules over us across the globe so naturally the people who respect the sovereignty of their nations they should be livid about this type of stuff and seeking not just retribution but destruction of those that are violating their sovereignty that is historical precedence of this section it is required for any purpose specified in section 17b1 of the alaska native claims settlement act he is authorized to acquire such easement by 
purchase or otherwise, the acquisition of such an easement shall be deemed a public purpose for which the secretary may exercise his exchange authority pursuant to section 22F or 22F of the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act. Again, that word right there. Deemed a public purpose and may exercise his exchange authority. 1164, extent of foregoing provisions. Sections 1161 to 1163 of this title shall be apl applicable to all cases of suspended entries and lo locations which have arisen in the Bureau of Land Management since the 26th day of June 1856, as well as to all cases of similar kind which may hereafter after occur. So the interesting part is that it states the Bureau of Land Management since the 26th day of June 1856. And this is RS 2457-1946 reorg. So there's some interesting stuff going on there with the dates. And it was derived from the Act June 26, 1856. Again, derived, it could have been interpreted into a different way to, quote, fit contemporary times. So we don't actually know what was going on in June 1856. Have to find an act, and then you'd have to trust that act hasn't been tampered with. And uh, these people are, are really, they're capable of every crime possible. So, yeah, tampering with, with previous stuff is, is not beyond them, as I have demonstrated in previous videos. Anyway, um, and here I have to occur. Embracing as well locations under bounty land warrants. Right? What is a bounty land warrant? It's kind of interesting. As ordinary entries or sales, including homestead entries and presumption locations or cases, where the law, you know which law is that, right? Has been substantially complied with. Substantially complied with. Ugh. And the error or informality arose from ignorance, accident, or mistake, which is satisfactorily explained, and where the rights of no other claimant or preemptor are prejudiced, or where there is no adverse claim. Now we come to a thesis talking about language and the foundation of how all of this stuff works, and the reason why we barely understand the basic fundamental language around these concepts that they constantly use against us and we're never taught the true reasons why and what they actually mean. They just use them and that's that. And we have to follow what they say or else. So this document is Language and Education Policy and Literacy Acquisition in Multilingual Uganda. Case Study of the Urban District of Kampala. Again, it's Language and Education Policy by Prosperous Nankindu, student number, thesis submitted and partial fulfillment of the requirement. And of course, this one has a supervisor, Professor Christopher Stroud. I wonder why somebody from Africa requires a supervising professor, especially with that name, but somebody from London does not. Abstract. This thesis is concerned with language and education policy and literacy acquisition in multilingual Uganda with the urban district of Kampala as the case study. Specifically, the study investigates the implementation of monoglot, mono meaning one, L-I-E-P for early literacy acquisition in multilingual situation. The thesis analysis analyzes three L-I-E-P instruments for Uganda, namely the 1992 government white paper on education. It'd be an interesting document to look at, and I bet it reflects that piece of crap that we have in the United States, the uh, cardinal principles on the reorganization of secondary education that is running our indoctrination system to make obedient slaves of today. The 1995 Constitution of the Republic of Uganda and three, the Uganda Education Sector Strategic Plan 2004 to 2015. After that analysis, the study presents views and perceptions of LIEP stakeholders in Uganda. Right, let's look at that again. LIEP stakeholders. LIEP is the Language and Education Policy Stakeholders, as in stakeholders of a company. Policymakers, and of course this is a semicolon, so these are the stakeholders. Policymakers, curriculum developers, literary 
literacy research searchers, NGO officials, head teachers, literacy teachers, and parents slash guardians. Parents slash guardians, of course, is the last one and least important, where all of these other people are clearly holding conflicts of interest when it comes to this particular thing, because naturally they would do anything that ha goes with their interest. Of course, the whole system is set up for their interests, so go figure. The study is mainly prompted by the LIP, which recommends English as the medium of instruction, but not the common language to be used throughout the primary school cycle. Isn't that interesting? It's the medium of instruction, but not the common language. That sounds like clandestine work behind the scenes. That's so that the people overseeing it don't have to learn what they see as a base language and they can understand that the people are still being appropriately indoctrinated according to their standards. That's fairly obvious there, I think. The thesis tries to shed light on the following aspects. Principles of a LIEP in a multilingual setting, a relevant LIEP model for multilingual situations, multilingualism, as a resource for literacy acquisition, appropriateness of a bilingual LIEP in Kampala with a local language, classroom, and home literacy practices, and la lastly, literacy acquisition. Yeah, lastly, literacy acquisition. The research question is to find out to the extent which to which the current LIEP in Uganda provides for literacy acquisition in multilingual settings. This study is an empirical case study in which mixed methods approach was used. This involved both qualitative and quantitative strategies of collecting and analyzing data. Such multi-methodical method, method, approaches are seen in studies in New Literacy Studies, Saxena 1994, Prince Lou and Breyer 1996, Martin Jones and Bott 1998. Martin Jones and Jones, 2000, Bainham, 2000, Street, 2000, Bainham, 2001, Bonda, 2003. In this study, various data was analyzed separately. Qualitative data was analyzed using two theories, the Critical Discourse Analysis, CDA, and New Literacy Studies, NLS. While quantitative data was processed using SPSS software and analyzed using descriptive statistical methods. A lot of coded wording going on there. NLS was used to evaluate the literacy acquisition methods in primary schools. NLS was supported by CDA to be able to analyze further the biases arising from the LIEP institutions and the respondents' views, opinions, perceptions, feelings, and attitudes. CDA helped the researchers research go beyond speculation and demonstrate how texts work, particularly when analyzing LIEP instruments. In continuation, using CDA, the researcher found out that the district of Kampala is not exceptionally compared is not exceptional compared to the rural areas in Uganda. As a policy in rural areas is to use local languages, some teachers in the urban district of Kampala have decided to improvise translanguaging strategies through the use of the translation strategy. Kanagaraja, 2006. Yeah, use of the translation strategy. Yeesh. And the use of stories, local names of places, games, rhymes, and songs. Teachers do this to be able to fit in to the multilingual situations in their primary one literacy classes. So it's all about the perception, the cover to implement what their true objective is. Right? Pretend to be like the people that you are selling out. It is probably one of the reasons why 27.4% of the learners were able to achieve advanced results in the literacy test, while 23.5% were adequate. However, despite the fact that LIEP for Kampala is responsible for, for that kind of performance, there are other determinants of literacy acquisition in the district. Such determinants include education level of parents slash guardians, their occupation and relationship with the child, buying of home reading materials, languages of or language of those reading materials, age and gender of learners, nursery attendance, school location, and school ownership. These determinants were statistically significant when learners' achievements and tests were cross-tabulated. Study concludes that LIEPs in Uganda have developed since 1877. That's an interesting date right there. They've developed since 1877. You know what that coincides with? The Treaty of 1871. After the fraudulent U.S. Civil War was conducted and the United States was eliminated as a player 
and put N as a subsidiary entity to do the bidding of the global union of corruption. Anyway, to date, when we now have the Education St Sector Strategic Plan, ESSP, that implies that the views and perceptions of stakeholders also keep on changing. Uh, views and perceptions of stakeholders keep changing. What a surprise. Cannot be predicted whether the issues of language and education in Uganda can be finally sorted out because even the current plan is still subjected to reviews and the policies already on paper deflect from practice. It is for such reasons that Blomert, 1999 BP page 37 says that the terms end or closure are not particularly suitable in the context of ideological debates and language politics. It is likely that after 2015 with regards to the LIEP for Uganda in the district of Kampala in particular, more discussion might be held, policies reviewed or others suggested. So there's some codified term in, terms there, right? Ideological debates and language politics. One must wonder in what context they're using those words, because they could mean many things depending on the context. But either way, it's all code language, and we pretty much know what it means. <laughs> they, they're, they're not creative people, and they pretty much only ever mean one thing. It has to do with uh, control and getting away with crime. That's it. They're unquestioned absolute control and the ability for them to disregard and get away with criminal activity violating basically every sense of the word sovereign that is not the Roman pontiff. It is likely that the after 2015 with regard to LIAP for Uganda and the district of Kampala in particular, more discussions might be held, policies reviewed or other reviewed or others suggested. Study then suggests change of stakeholders' beliefs, attitudes toward local languages, status language planning, which would enable a paradigm shift that would review LIEP for Kampala from a monoglot to a bi-multilingual education policy. So it's basically all about how they want people to be manageable, and they don't want people figuring things out. And so naturally their policies would change where they want everybody to learn language, English, or their language, and then they also don't. So that's, you know, the, the real true objective would naturally make them flip back and forth between uh, ideas about learning language and, and acquisition and all that stuff. But it all has to do with the fundamental programming of language to fit their ends. And one of those is obviously to subvert words like jury, judge, settlement, trust. And, uh, of course, all the other uh, important words that we noticed here in this video. Corpus language, or corpus, of course, meaning body, planning, which requires development of orthogra orthography as well as elaboration of vocabulary in order to respond to the widespread functions of the local languages. Schools to develop their own language plans and trying to implement the thematic curriculum, the promotion of bi-multilingualism in pre-service and in-service courses for primary school teachers in order to facilitate bi-multilingual learning and materials development and publication in local languages with a central focus on the promotion of bi-multilingual education. And of course, all of this stuff is perfectly explained in the book The Graves of Academe by Richard Mitchell, in which he talks about the true people that run the schools are as far from the classroom as possible. This is an example of exactly what he was talking about in that book. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please like it, share it, subscribe to my channels, check out my other content. And there are free books available at the link. Also, if you so desire, you may support my work at PayPal or Cash App. Thank you.